Well, th thank you, Larry. Um, thanks to Larry and Tamas, um, the Academy, for this invitation. I'm glad to be here today. Um, it's always hard to sum up what you do in 10 minutes. I'm going to try to give you a flavor of how we approach the uh, understanding how the brain controls basic things, including food intake and body weight, to potentially combat the, the, the obesity epidemic that Dr. Dietz so uh, nicely pointed out. Um, so I don't know where I pointed here. So to, to, uh, to address this, this obesity epidemic, um, we formed what we call a task force on obesity research at South Southwestern. And I usually speak following my friend Jay Horton, and I, I imagine he may mention this briefly. But this is basically a, a multidisciplinary uh, approach that we've developed at Southwestern to try to understand how basic things like food intake and body weight are controlled in the context of the, of the obesity epidemic. I lead a team, as I'll show you, the, uh, to investigate how the brain controls energy balance. We have a team using cutting edge imaging techniques to study both humans and, and, and uh, mouse models to understand how, how uh, obesity affects our basic metabolism. Um, we have a very strong group investigating molecular mechanisms of, of metabolism as it relates to, to liver function, for example, that Jay will talk about. And then mo importantly, we have a, a really nice uh, team to investigate uh, the human uh, condition, and that is using the power of human genetics led by Helen Hobbs and Jonathan Cohen to understand what genes may be playing a role in, in regulating body weight and obesity in humans. And so um, Dr. Dietz outlined the problem, and in theory, it's very simple. How much intake there is and how much you expend can def defines how much you weigh. And um, it sounds simple, and in theory it is, but in reality we all know that that's not the case. And it's been known for almost 80 years now that a part of your brain is critical in regulating food intake and body weight, and this is the, the hypothalamus. And this was a f classic set of experiments in which investigators made lesions. They disrupted areas of the brain called the hypothalamus, and they produced this massive overeating and hyper uh, obese phenotype. And so if the hypothalamus controls feeding, we should be able to easily understand how it works. Unfortunately, the hypothalamus is an area of the brain that looks a lot like that slide Dr. Dietz showed with, from the UK with all of those arrows. The hypothalamus is probably more complicated. My, my former mentor, Cliff Saper, describes the hypothalamus as a collection of neurons that are connected in an incestuous web. So it's, it's a very complicated structure. And so to address this, what we've done is, uh, is to use the power of mouse genetics to un unravel it. And, through the past 20 years or so, there's been a number of uh, studies that have led to a prevalent model of energy balance, and the details are important, but there are neurons that are candidates to mediate controlling food intake and body weight. But as I said, it's very hard to, to test these hypotheses directly. And so more than a decade ago, we, meaning my colleague Brad Lowell and I, um, from Brad in Boston, um, set out to use the power of mouse genetics to test these circuits, to manipulate these circuits in awake behaving animals, in this case, mice. Because mice are the, the workhorse of science nowadays because you can do genetic engineering in a very powerful way. And the, the way the system works that we use is we engineer mice to express a protein called Cre recombinase. The name's not important except to remember that it acts as a scissors. It's a molecular scissors that can snip out pieces of DNA as outlined here, that we can engineer around any gene. And so we can put this scissor in one class of neuron. We can engineer the gene that we're interested in with these, these DNA se flanking sequences. And the way the system works is you breed the mice together, and the scissors cuts out this piece of DNA, and you can knock out or manipulate the gene of interest. And so. What we've done is spent the better part of a decade making a toolbox of genetically modified mice to tease apart these circuits in the brain. And so all of these mice here represent mice that express this molecular scissors, Cre recombinase, in all these different classes of neurons. The names aren't important, but we can now manipulate genes in all of these different neurons specifically. And we can then modify our favorite genes that we think are important in regulating body weight, shown here, 
and we can just, just like ordering off a menu, you can say, okay, I want to take this mouse and knock out this gene here. So you just cross these two mice and you can knock out the leptin receptor from that neuron. And as you can see, we've got a large collection of mice. And this, this, this is what really underlies our program and, and, and what we've been doing for the decade, past decade or so. And I'm going to show you one example of what we've done to, to, to address this. And so many of you have probably heard of the neurotransmitter serotonin. And we've spent a long time investigating the role of serotonin in regulating food intake and body weight. And uh, 10 years of work is kind of summed up in this summary slide. And what, what we think is that serotonin may be acting on this neuron called the POMC neuron that was in the previous diagram. We know now this is an important neuron for regulating food intake and body weight. And we think the serotonin acting on this receptor here may affect metabolism and feeding. And why would we be interested in serotonin? Well, many of you in the audience may remember, when I speak to the students, they don't remember this because they're too young, but many of you may remember fenfluramine of fenfenfen. And fenfen, I think it's safe to say, was the safest, or that, not the safest, the most efficacious anti-obesity drug. And you talk to patients that were on the drug, and it, it really worked. Um, unfortunately, the drug had to be removed, as I'll mention in a second. But when we started this work, if you looked at Dr. Gilman's textbook, for how fenfluramine worked, it increased serotonin release and inhibited its reuptake, which isn't very specific, of course. So we set out to figure out how it may work, and I'll show you how we use mouse genetics. Fenfluramine had to be removed from the market because of a series of papers, including this famous one in the New England Journal, describing patients taking the drug having uh, valve lesions or heart problems. And the uh, American Home Products, who was marketing the drug at the time, settled a class action lawsuit, of course, and the drug was removed, I think, in 97, I think. And so, what caught our attention, though, was that fenfluramine seems to act on a certain receptor. And so here's a black bar showing a mouse response to fenfluramine to decrease its food intake. In mice lacking a serotonin receptor, the 2C receptor, this response was blunted. And so what we set out to do is to see if this receptor acting on the POMC cells is a critical regulator of how fenfluramine works. And the way we did that is a little bit um, uncommon in that we started with a mouse that has no serotonin 2C receptor. And we knew from the literature this mouse was obese, diabetic, hyperphagic. And so we engineered a mouse then where we could restore the 2C receptor expression only in a certain class of neurons, and in this case, these so-called POMC neurons. And we wanted to see if this restoration of the receptor would rescue this obesity phenotype and restore the ability of drugs like fenfluramine to, to reduce food intake and body weight. And this work was um, published uh, a couple of years ago now. And so the, the strategy is we engineer in a stop sign. This is a transcriptional blocker. So this stops the gene from being expressed. And we put these so-called LOXP sites around the blocker. We then breed these mice to Cree mice. So with no Cree, there's no serotonin 2C receptors. So they should be like the knockout, obese, hyperphagic, et cetera. When we breed them to the POMC Cree mice, the mice with Cree only in these POMC neurons, the molecular scissors, the mice will have the receptor only in those neurons. Okay? So what happens? Well, expectedly, when we have no 2C serotonin receptor, the animals get very obese, especially on a high-fat diet, they take off. By putting back the receptor only in the POMC neurons, we're talking about a few thousand neurons in the hypothalamus, we completely rescue the obesity and the overeating in these mice. So this is a circuit in the brain that's sufficient to explain how serotonin 2C receptors can regulate body weight. And we're talking about, I don't know, two, 3,000 neurons at the most, probably. Importantly, for, for the idea of, of uh, the, the fenfluramine, though, when we give animals fenfluramine, you see the control animals here will reduce their food intake when given a dose of defenfluramine. The 2C nulls, expectedly, as reported previously, show a blunted response. By putting back the receptor only in this POMC neuron, we can restore the ability of this class of drugs to produce anorexia. So again, this is a neural circuit that's sufficient to explain how this class of drugs works. Now, um, many of you in the audience that know a little something about hypothalamus and serotonin know that it's, it's, serotonin is widely expressed. There are receptors all over the brain. And so this does not mean this is the only circuit in the brain through this way this drug is acting. And so now we've developed mice that we haven't published yet in which we can now delete the serotonin-2 receptor only in the POMC neurons, leaving the receptor intact everywhere else in the body. And our preliminary data looks like, indeed, when we take away the 2C receptor, the serotonin receptor only in the POMC neurons, we do produce obesity and show a blunted response to the fenfluramine. So we think this really is a circuit in the brain through which this class of drugs that were effective at treating obesity in humans work. 
So is there any translational significance besides the fenfluramine? Well, there is still hope in that there is a company in California called Arena Pharmaceuticals who have developed agonists or activators of the 2C receptor specifically, a more specific drug, if you will, than the fenfluramine. Um, it is still alive, um, but it looks like the uh, drug uh, potentially is efficacious. They have some safety issues, and so we'll see. The, the jury's still out about this class of drugs. Now, lastly, I just want to point out that despite the fact we can now understand how these circuits in the brain work, translating it into humans right now is difficult because there are really no good pharmaceutical interventions to treat obesity. Um, fenfluramine, obviously, I mentioned. There was recently two drugs from Merck and Santa Fe Aventis that targeted the cannabinoid receptors, but they had problems with depression. So the, the bottom line is making drugs to affect body weight is a really tough business right now, and I'm actually glad I'm in the academic side rather than the pharmaceutical side at this point because it's a tough business. For better or for worse, the best treatment we have right now for our very obese patients is gastric bypass surgery, whether it be the Roux and Y gastric bypass, just shown in this cartoon, the gastric band, the gastric sleeve. You guys have all seen the commercials. Um, and so we are very interested in understanding why gastric bypass works to reduce body weight, and also it has profound effects to reduce the diabetes in these individuals before significant weight loss. And so to do this, at Southwestern, we've actually recruited a person, Vincent Aguirre, to our division who does gastric bypass in mice. That may sound kind of humorous, but uh, it's actually, I think, very important. As you can imagine, gastric bypass surgery in mice is technically very demanding because they're so small. But Vince has developed this, and these are two gr groups of obese mice. You can see all of these guys were the control group. These guys all had the surgery, and you can see he can produce wet weight loss. He can produce uh, improvements in their diabetes. So we're really excited about this. But moreover, and I think the power of this, we can now take our mouse genetic tricks and apply it to this model. And Vince has some very exciting data that I'm not gonna go into, but we've identified one class of neurons that seems to be critical for the beneficial act actions of the gastric bypass surgery. And we were very actively pursuing that. And the hope is, of course, that if we can understand the genes and the molecules that are the targets of the bypass surgeries, then, we, then pharmacologically we could intervene rather than going through the gastric bypass surgery. So I'll just end there. We've developed a new research center at UT Southwestern focused on this tiny area of the brain called the hypothalamus. We have a number of investigators actively working. Of course, we have research partners, um, and we're going to hear about uh, when Jay talks next. And so um, it's, it's Clearly a, a difficult problem we're tackling, but we're optimistic that we'll be able to make, uh, make uh, inroads into this problem in the future. So I'll stop there and take questions. I should have worn my sunglasses up here. It's bright. Can we turn this on? Yeah, sure. That's uh, very interesting that you did gastric surgery, uh, bypass surgery in these mice. Uh, in humans, when you do gastric bypass surgery, uh, very often, as you know, you lose your diabetes mm -hmm. before you lose your obesity. Mm -hmm. So what happened to these mice? So it's a very good question. It's one of the, the reasons we're doing these experiments. And we, we don't know what changes in the gut. We, we don't know. We know some pathways in the brain that seem to be required for these anti-diabetic actions. It belongs to the melanocortin pathway. Vince's data suggests it's the melanocortin-4 system. How we get from a change in the wiring of the gut to the melanocortin system in the brain is unclear and I think very exciting, though. Um, we're wondering if the vagus nerve, which innervates a lot of the viscera, is being disrupted. But at this point, the answer is we don't know, but you're exactly right. In the, in the mice, just like the humans, there are these rapid effects to improve the diabetes before the animals lose significant weight. Yes? Just a quick question about this. My understanding is that this isn't a permanent solution for many people. You're and talking about the gastric bypass? About the gastric yeah. bypass or banding or all of those, and that there are particular danger and developmental issues in young people. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is, um, can you address the larger, the larger themes that Bill was talking about in his first talk as how they relate to um, these pharma and mechanical solutions? They have yeah. to go together. Well, they? That, that's the edge of my comfort zone, and we have a whole panel here that, that is better at that than me. Um, you, our strategy is if we could understand the 
the, the molecules and the genes involved, then our colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry may be able to develop more targeted approaches um, that would negate the need for children to have bypass surgery. I mean, I know colleagues in Children's Hospital in Boston are now starting to do more and more gastric bypass surgery in children, and so that's the idea. For example, in the finfluorine work I didn't show you, we now know down to the ion channel what is the mechanism that links uh, the actions of serotonin and these drugs to the anorectic properties. And so it's our hope, again, that people that are in the drug business can look at that data and design safer drugs that wouldn't affect heart valves, for example. And so, so that, that's where the goal, but, but we really are, are at the, the very basic level. Any other questions? Yes. Should, should the risk benefit of FenFen be re-examined? Well, I've always, I haven't followed that very closely, and may, our panel maybe could comment, or Dr. Dietz, but I always wondered if it was good lawyering and bad science or a combination of both. And it's clear the drugs work, and these two C-specific agonists from ARENA, the data looks pretty promising. Uh, my understanding is it was phase two trials, I believe. I, I think it was, they had a, a cancer blip, I think, or some, something that came up um, with, the, with their drug, and maybe someone can comment on that. But it's clear in mice that, that, that the drug works. We can even, I didn't get into it, we can lower the dose in mice and have it be a very effective anti-diabetic drug that does nothing to food intake and body weight. And it's still through this 2C POMC pathway that I mentioned. And so, you know, I, I'm not in the drug business, so I don't know, you know, what, what the cost benefit of that is. But it clearly was efficacious in humans while they were giving it to them. 